Chapter 3. The Wave of a Handkerchief He stood smiling in the doorframe leading aft to the rear entrance port. There was all grace in his posture, in the easy angle at which one arm rested against the side bulkhead, in the casual way in which he held the ray gun that bored straight at Kars. Height and strength he had, and a perfectly proportioned figure. Beauty, too, of face, with skin of clearest saffron. Soft, sensitive mouth and ascetic cheeks. His hair was fine and black, and swept straightly back from the high, narrow forehead where lived his tremendous intelligence. It was his eyes that gave him away, his eyes of rare green that, from a distance, looked black. Slanting, veiled, unreadable beneath the lowered, silky lashes, there was the soul of a tiger in their sinister depths. It was his eyes that his victims remembered. So you have arrived, Dr. Koo, whispered Hawk Kars, and for a second he too smiled, with eyes as bleak and hard as frosty chilled steel. Their glances met and held, the cold hard honest rapier, the subtle perfumed poison. The other men in the cabin were forgotten. The feeling was between these two. Strikingly contrasted, they stood there. Kars, in rough blue denim trousers, faded work shirt open at the neck, old-fashioned rubber shoes and battered skipper's cap askew on his flaxen hair. Ku Sui, suavely impeccable in high-collared green silk blouse, full-length trousers of the same material and red slippers to match the wide sash which revealed the slender lines of his waist. A perfume hung about the man, the indescribable odor of tsinsin flowers from the humid jungles of Venus. <laughs> of course Venus is the jungle. They should just kiss. You see, I meet you halfway, my friend, the Eurasian said with delicate mock courtesy. A surpassing pleasure I have anticipated for a long time. No, no, I see that already I shall have to ask you a small favor. A thousand pardons. It's my deplorable ability to read your mind that requires me to ask it. Your so justly famed speed on the draw might possibly overcome this advantage. He raised his ray gun slightly. And though I know you would not kill me, save in the direst emergency, since you wish to take me a living prisoner, I would find it most distressing to have to carry for the rest of my life a flaw on my body. So... May I request you to withdraw your ray guns with two fingertips and put them on the floor. Observe your fingertips. Will you be so kind? The hawk looked at him for a minute. Then, silently, he obeyed. He knew that the Eurasian would have no compunctions about shooting him down in cold blood. But on the other hand, even as the man had said... He could not kill Kusui, but had to capture him in order to take him to Earth to confess the crimes now blamed on Elliot Lethgow. Do as he says, Friday, he instructed the still-staring Negro, and, like a man in a trance, Friday obeyed. Thank you, the Eurasian said. It was a most friendly thing to do. He paused. I suppose you are wondering how I arrived here, and why you did not see me come. Well, I shall certainly tell you in return for your favor. But first, ah, friend Kors, your gesture, a reminder, I assume. Slowly the hawk was stroking the bangs of hair which had been trained to obscure his forehead. There was no emotion on his chilly face as he answered, no slightest sign of feeling unless it were a slight trembling of the left eyelid. Significant enough to those who could read it. 
Yes, he whispered, a reminder. I do not like to wear my hair like this, Kusui, and I want you to know that I've not forgotten. That, though I'm now in your power, there'll be a day. But you wouldn't threaten your host, the other said with mock surprise, and surely you wouldn't threaten me of all men. Must I point out how useless it has always been for you to match yourself, merely a skillful gunman, against me, against a brain? Usually, the cold whisper came back, the brain has failed in the traps it has laid for the gunman. Only because of the mistakes of its agents. Unfortunately for you, the brain is dealing with you directly this time, my friend. It's quite a different matter. But this small talk, although you honor... Of course you intend to kill me, said the hawk. But when? Dr. Ku gestured deprecatingly. You insist on introducing these unpleasant topics. But to relieve your mind, I've not yet decided how I can entertain you most suitably. I have come primarily to ask you one trifling thing. And that is? The whereabouts of Master Scientist Elliot Lithgow. Hawk Kars smiled. Your conceit lends you an extraordinary optimism, Dr. Koo. Not unfounded, I am sure. I desire very much to meet our old friend Lithgow again. His is the only other brain in this universe at all comparable to mine. And did I tell you that I always get what I desire? Well, will you give me this information? Of course, there are ways. For a moment, he waited. The hawk only looked at him. Always in character, the Eurasian said regretfully. Very well. He turned his head and took in Friday and Seiko, standing nearby. You are Seiko? he asked the latter. It is most unfortunate that you had to deceive me a little while ago. We shall have to see what to do about it. Later. For the present, move farther back, out of the way. So, you, black one, next to my friend Kars, we must be moving along. So. Kusui surveyed them with inscrutable eyes. Gracefully, he drew close. Kars missed not a move. He watched the Eurasian draw from one of the long sleeves of his blouse a square of lustrous black silk. This bears my personal insignia, you see, he murmured. You will remember it. And he languidly waved it just under their eyes. Friday stared at it, Kars too, wonderingly. He saw embroidered in yellow on the black a familiar insignia composed of an asteroid in the circle of ten planets. And then alarm lit his brain and he grimaced. There was a strange odor in his nostrils and it came from the square of silk. Does this smell like chloroform to you? <laughs> no. Characteristic, Dr. Koo, he said. Quite characteristic. The Eurasian smiled. An expression of stupid amazement came over Friday's face. The design of asteroid and planets wavered into a blur as the hawk fought unconsciousness. A short, harsh sound came from his lips. He lurched uncertainly. The Negro crumpled up and stretched out on the deck. Kars's desire to sleep grew overpowering. Once more, as from a distance, he glimpsed Ku Sui's smile. He tried to back to the wall, made it, then a heavy thump suggested to his dimming mind that he had collapsed to the deck. He was asleep at once.